Uh, most mountain bikes will have 10 speeds or 11 or now even 12. But for downhill bikes, they don't need those climbing gears. They want, they want to be light, they want to be fast, and they only need the gears for downhill. And then we've got this ugly little fellow down here. This little, I, don't know what to call it. I, I hate derailers. That, that's the rear derailleur. And, and that's kind of the starting point is by getting rid of this and, and finding a better way. Um, I mean, I, I talked about how technology has advanced. But the derailleur hasn't changed. Fundamentally, it works in the same manner as it did in 1931. I mean, yes, it's the evolutionary change. They're certainly more robust, and they, they work, and they're, they're reasonable. Um, but, but fundamentally, it's basically the same. And I think there's got to be a way. Um, look at the problem here. The, the, at the most basic level is that derailers are fragile things that are sticking out in a very exposed location. And so broken derailers are, are a huge problem. Frequently, races have been lost because of these sort of mechanical drivetrain failures. So here's some of the other problems. We talked about broken derailleurs. But if your derailleur breaks, it's more than just the derailleur breaking, good chance it's going to go into the spokes, break half your spokes in your rear wheel, come around, maybe jam into the frame, possibly break the frame, lock up the rear wheel, probably cause you to crash. So really a broken derailleur could, you know, um, So that's sort of the most obvious thing. Uh, high maintenance, high wear, the frequently needing adjustment, poor chain tension. If you look here, this rider is sort of landing a big flat drop, this is at Whistler, um, and look at his chain, it's just slapping around. Right? It's, it's, there's a lot of what's called chain slap, and that's what leads to jamming and derailing. So that's quite bad. Those are sort of the obvious things. But it turns out these last two, they're a bit more subtle, but these are the most important points of this list. High unsprung weight. Uh, a derailleur and cassette will weigh between 700 and 800 grams, you know, most of a kilogram. That's a lot of weight to have out at the end of your swing arm. Talk about that in a second. And poor chain line, I'm also going to define that in a couple ways. So, unsprung weight, or more correctly, it would be to say unsprung mass. The idea is that you want to have as much as possible, you want to have all of the mass carried on the suspended part of the bike. So in a car, you know, you want as much of the total weight to be carried in the suspended area of the vehicle. And here we saw it represents a tire, uh, you know, we've got tire stiffness, but here's the, the wheel and the suspension is unsprung mass. And then you've got your coil spring and oil damper, and then here's the sprung mass. So that's the rider and the mainframe of the bike. And as much as possible, you want to take weight off of this, off of this part and put it on that part, reducing unsprung mass. It has a huge effect on suspension performance, the ability to track the terrain and traction control. And then I said poor chain line. I want to define chain line in two different ways. The classic definition of chain line is the sort of spacing of the chain to the right of the center line of the bike. But you can see here as you go through the different gears, it forces the chain to bend. And this is not ideal. Uh, so chains have been designed to be flexible, to allow this, this, this shifting and this misalignment to occur, but it's not great. It would be better if it could run you know, straight. It would be more efficient. The other definition of chain line Going back to this picture, this line, this upper chain, is the one that transmits all the power and torque to the rear wheel. So it's under tremendous tension. And its position is defined by the diameter of this chain ring. Okay? So there's a point here where this line is tangent to that circle. And so frame designers, when they're designing the rear suspension, they're constrained. That's the main swing arm pivot location on a typical bike. And it has to be. They can't go very far above or below this chain line because it would have adverse effects on the suspension. If you mounted the main swing arm pivot up high, then that chain tension would cause the rear suspension to kind of jack up and lock out and under chain, under pedaling force, your suspension would lock out. So that's terrible. And 
Conversely, if you put the swing arm pivot down low, then the chain tension would cause the bike to sag and bob with every pedal stroke, and you'd lose all your energy to suspension movement, which is also unhealthy. So for neutral suspension, it has to be located close to this chain line. Another thing to do with this pivot point, though, the side effect of that, is this axle path, or you could call it the wheel path, or the wheel trajectory. And so because it's essentially an arc about that center point, this trajectory starts nearly vertical, but then arcs forward, causing the whole wheel base of the bike to get shorter as it gets deeper into the travel. And so that's not ideal either. And I'll come back to this again and explain what, what would be a better way to go about designing a bike frame. Okay, so I've said there's lots of problems with derailers. So what are the alternatives? Well, the classic alternative are internally geared rear hubs. So these have been around just as long as derailers. 1936, the Sturmey Archer, this is British made. This is a three-speed, internally geared rear hub. It's got a single sprocket on the outside, but inside there's a, a system of hub gears. And how does this work? It, it's a technically, the broader term is epicyclic. But specifically, this is a planetary gearbox or gear train. Right. And so we've got several components. The center, most right in the center, is the, the sun gear. And it's surrounded by several planets, three, four, or six planets. They're all joined by this planet carrier. And on the outside is a ring gear. And you can get lots of different gear ratios out of it. Uh, by locking and unlocking different components, by putting power in through the sun, for example, and taking power out from the planet carrier with a locked ring. That would be one of the combinations, and there are like, six different combinations. And then, of course, changing the number of teeth would give you different ratios as well. So that's what they started with, that's how it works. Um, much more recently, uh, Shimano, these are Japanese-made hubs, the Nexus, uh, for the last decade, and then more recently, the Alfine hub came out, which is uh, available in 8 and 11 speed versions. Uh, several of us here in the audience have commuter bikes uh, with Alfine hubs, and, and they're basically great. They're, they're quiet and efficient and low maintenance, um, smooth, whatever you want to say. Um, so, so, yeah, they work really well for that application, which is commuter bikes, basically. Um, and then sort of the top of the line, internally geared rear hub, is German-made roll-off hub. Roll-off speed hub, it's called. And it's got 14 speeds internally. And it's, to be honest, a, a marvel of engineering. Like how they fit 14 speeds in this hub, um, I still don't quite got them. Um, let's have a close look at the inside, sort of laid out. You can see all the sun and planets and the green gears. Let's have a closer look at the axle arrangement. I just want to highlight sort of how it changes gears. This big component here is, is the fixed axle, which is attached to the frame and doesn't move. And inside that is this little shaft, which is the shifting mechanism, and it rotates when you change gears. And on here, you might be able to make out little flats and this little strange passageway and little cams. And so as that rotates, when you change gears, it causes these little devices called a pawl to lift or lower you know, and lock and unlock the different sun gears. And you can see this little corresponding one-way ratchet on the inside of the sun gear. So the pawl lifts and locks that sun gear, and in that way, sort of selects that gear to drive. Um, so... As I said, this was for commuter bikes. Oh, and so this, this is, this is the, the roll-off speed hub here on my commuter bike. Shift on the fly. You don't have to be pedaling. It's got a rotary shifter. You can just twist, dump 14 gears, and now I'm in, now I'm in the top speed right there. This whole bike was pretty much designed around that hub, and this is actually how I built this bike myself. Um, but if, if this hub is, is so, so good, then, then maybe problem solved, right? Let's just, let's just use these hubs. Uh, but the problem is the weight, the unsprung weight. So I tried this. This was about a decade ago. I put a roll-off hub on my downhill bike. I took it to Whistler. After that, me doing a little, little drop. Um, 
and it was awful. The suspension was terrible. That extra mass at the end of the swing arm meant that the wheel couldn't follow the terrain, and as a result, you know, worse traction, worse, less control, but also more flat tires, more dents in the rim. Um, just overall, not, not a great experience. So that's not going to work. So wouldn't it be good to take that mass off of the swing arm and put it in the main frame of the bike? That's where a gearbox should really live. In, in, the, in the suspended mass, in the center of the frame. And again, we can go back to the 1930s. The beautifully named Mutaped Phoebus from Switzerland uh, was a three-speed gearbox mounted at the bottom bracket, really kind of ahead of its time. Um, and and there have been sort of sporadically different little gearboxes throughout the years. None have made a commercial success. None of them are really still around until just recently. Let's skip forward this millennium, um, Honda, Honda Motorsports, they, they made an, an attempt at this. This was never commercially available, but they made a big push in, into downhill mountain bike racing, their team trailers, and, and, and this beautiful chrome bike. And this, this gearbox, I mean, it, it's huge. It's huge. It's carbon fiber shell on it, but it's an enormous thing. Um, and for the longest time, nobody knew how it worked. It was sh shrouded in secrecy. And at the end of each race, Japanese scientists in lab coats would unbolt it off the bike and carry it into the, you know, secret it away into the team truck and behind closed doors. And it wasn't until like the Canadian importer for this brand, and I've worked closely with the, the owner of the company on, on a few little projects. Um, so this, these have been up for about six months. It's fairly new. Full carbon fiber frame. It's got the 12 speed version of the pinion gearbox. Here you can see that the drivetrain is not turning. So rotate the cranks. There we go. Again, it's got a rotary shifter with 12 speeds. That'll be, there, that's the easiest gear. And turning slower than the input. And here, turning much faster than the input. You don't have to be pedaling to shift. You just pick a gear. And as soon as you pedal, you're in that gear. Really, really nice. But it's not a downhill bike. It's designed for all mountain use, you what they call it, enduro, or general purpose bike that you can climb with as well as descend with. So for downhill, suspension performance is paramount. And so I want to just let's just go away from gearboxes for a second, and I want to introduce another kind of bike. This is called a high pivot bike. And last year we had a talk from, from uh, PJ Hunton, who's the engineering manager at Norco. So Norco Bikes are a Portland Portland company, and this is their prototype. And really unique. Uh, you can see that the chain is routed up and over a high pivot. So this is the main swing arm pivot. Let me identify it right there. That's the pivot point for the swing arm. And of course, the traditional chain line wouldn't work it would just lock out the suspension every time you pedal. So that for, this to have, for this to work, to have this pivot point, you have to route the chain up and over close to the pivot point. And then in the back, of course, it's got a conventional uh, derailleur. And there's, uh, wait, and then if you see the wheel path now, so the difference, the whole purpose of having this high pivot point is that the wheel path is much more rearward it has this rearward trajectory that has a number of advantages. First of all, the sort of average direction lines up much better with the, the sort of angle of the fork. Right? So as the fork compresses, as both ends compress, the wheelbase remains more constant. So in that way, um, it's more predictable, more stable, and sort of better behavior under full compression, big bottom out impacts. And one long wheelbase, you've got it. But even bigger point is the sort of forces that are imparted on the suspension when you hit big impacts. Imagine a uh, rock the size of a shoebox and going through a rock garden, and you're hitting things probably right about here, bang, bang, bang. And that force direction lines up better with the trajectory of the wheel. And because of that, the wheel is able to lift up more easily and get out of the way of impacts so it absorbs rough terrain much better. Actually picks up speed through rough terrain where normal bikes kind of, kind of get hung up on every little impact. 
So it's a huge advantage. Lots of companies are starting to pick up on this idea. How can we get a high pivot? And so here's another company out of Andorra, Homansal. They've got you know, the same thing going on. And then I want to introduce this bike. This is kind of a special bike. This is a steel bike for out of New York, Brooklyn Machine Works. Uh, they want a different path. Instead of having one chain going up and over an idler, they've actually got two chains. And this, this primary drive chain is actually on the left side of the bike. And it goes up to a sprocket, which is fixed to an axle that goes through the bike. And then there's another sprocket on the right-hand side, and then a sort of conventional drivetrain on the other side. So this kind of arrangement is called a jack shaft. Um, and this bike's famous for being able to handle roughest terrain. But looking at this, you've got a lot of hardware going on right there. You've got two sprockets, a whole number of bearings, a big shaft through the middle. Wouldn't it be good if the gearbox could live there? That's my idea. Put the gearbox right there. Um, and I'm not the first person to think this. So let's bring these two concepts back together. Gearboxes, high pivot bike. This is the first example I've found. This is from Paul Brody, uh, Brody Bikes. He's actually the guy who taught me out of, well, bikes. I made mean, this with him. Um, and uh, he made this prototype, I think this was in 1997, so really a visionary. Um, he's, this one has a right side primary drive up to a uh, nexus hub, and then there's a secondary chain that goes to the rear wheel. And he's had to make a few compromises here in the back. For example, because it's left side drive, he's had to take the rear hub and make a custom rear hub and flip it around, and the brake is mounted on the right, which is not really ideal. It works. GT is a rather big company, probably the biggest company to try their hand at, at gearbox bikes. And they came quite close with this, but again, it's got the, the, the sort of the internals from uh, a Nexus hub, a seven speeder, uh, a yeah, Shimano Nexus, have been sort of uh, used in the form of a gearbox here. And so there's a chain up to it, and then another chain to the rear wheel. And, and finally, there, and there have been a, s several other examples like that. But this is back to zero. This is the zero G2. And it's got both chains are on the right hand side. And hidden in here is a Shimano Alpine 8 speed hub. Let's get there a little closer detail. You can see the hub mounted. So these are, these are hub mounting nuts. And that, that's a hub axle through the middle. So it's quite wide. But let me show you the suspension action on this. As you compress it, you can see how the rear end, I don't know if you can see, but it has this effect of getting much longer as it goes through its travel. And that gives incredible stability in, in rough terrain, as well as that sort of bump absorption ability. This one has a trigger shifter, so I can just select whatever gear I want, and as soon as I pedal, I'm already in that gear. Really popular with uh, like um, people who are maybe maybe not racing downhill bikes, but they're going to spend the summer living at uh, Whistler, for example, riding a bike park all day, every day. They want a bike that can absorb the hits, the durable, low maintenance. That's sort of the niche. So where does my idea fit in? The problem with this is that in all these these last several examples I've given you, they've all used an internally geared rear hub as a gearbox, right? It's sort of been the enabling technology that because these hubs exist, let's just design the frame around it. But that's not ideal. First of all, it's really wide across here, right? So that's a, a decent size you know, thing to have between your, down between your calf there. You kind of rub your legs on these, these, these axle nuts. Uh, but that's not the big problem. Um, it's just that no one's made a purpose-built gearbox for this type of application. Uh, one thing that's funny is because it's a hub and the frame's designed around that, hubs have a fixed axle and then a rotating shell by design. But if you look at any other gearbox, pinion gearbox or an automotive or motorcycle or industrial gearbox, they've all got a fixed shell and rotating axles. So from the point of view of inertia, it's, it's a lot more energy is required to accelerate this hub shell. So I wanted to invert all that and design a purpose-built gearbox 
for this sort of application for high pivot downhill bikes specifically. It would be chain driven, a chain up to it, and then another chain to the rear wheel. As I said, a fixed outer shell instead of a fixed axle. Oh, lots of adjectives we can throw at it. Compact, lightweight, efficient, what else? indestructible, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as much as possible, I wanted to use standard mountain bike components. So I want to use standard cranks, hubs, brakes, etc. But of course, it is a purpose-built frame to accommodate such a hub, such a gearbox. And I recognize there's some challenges. Right? It is not an enormous market. Uh, downhill bikes make up a very small portion of the overall bicycle industry. But it's one that I would suggest is poised to grow. Global warming, more and more ski areas are waking up to this idea of opening bike parks in the longer and longer seasons. Um, maybe when we have no snow at all, you know, the local hills will just become year-round bike park. Um, a year-round bike park just open on the sunshine and coastal. Um, uh, so I think this is poised to grow. And secondly, it's not just downhill bikes, but it's this intersection, this very small niche here where downhill bikes, gearbox bikes, and high pivot bikes intersect. So that's what I'm designing, the downhill high pivot gearbox bike. And there's, there's more challenges. These are the three elephants in the room. Um, anytime I bring up this idea with someone, you know, you've heard about the, maybe you've heard the term an elevator speech. You know, tell me in just a few minutes what your project's about. Well, I can't. You know, it's just way too complicated. I have to give you the whole backstory before you can really understand where this fits in. Um, and then these, these three things invariably come up. And way too much. It could not too much. And what about efficiency? So weight, as I've said, what's more important than just the overall weight of the bike is this ratio of sprung to unsprung mass. It's a little bit harder to measure, harder to quantify, whereas you can just weigh the overall bike and say, mine's 35, yours is 36, so I'm a pound better than yours, you know, whatever. Um, but I would say that, um, that that's not the measure uh, that we want to use for, for sort of suspension performance. Um, in fact, some the tuners now are starting to add lead ballast to the mainframes to make their bikes heavier because they track straighter and the suspension is, uh, reacts better. So, so weight's not that important. Um, efficiency, that's, that's sort of an unknown at this point. Uh, it's going to depend on the manufacturing tolerances of all the gears, the, the surface finishes, the precision that everything's made to. Um, but, but the Nexus and Alpine hubs, and the pinion gearbox, they compete quite well with traditional drivetrains on the basis of efficiency. With 94, 95% efficient, whereas a traditional drivetrain might be 97, 98% efficient when perfectly tuned, perfectly clean, and everything's just right. Yes, the traditional drivetrain can be more efficient. But as soon as you introduce mud and, and maybe some misalignment, then I think they're going to be more on par. Um, and of course, the Gearbox-based bike will be infinitely more efficient than a broken derailleur. <laughs> um, and then cost. Well, I think of downhill racing as kind of like the F1 racing uh, of the sport, right? So, so these teams have some resources. They've got big team support trucks. The racers get stacks of bikes and, and, and tires and whatever they basically need. So, if this were to add, you know, a thousand bucks to the cost of a complete frame, I don't see that as being a deal breaker at all. So I really started then researching how am I going to design something better, a purpose built gearbox, how we describe it. And so I looked at motorbikes. How does a motorbike gearbox work? And so what I want to introduce here is this concept of an external gear selection mechanism. And in this case, this is a this is a this is a, one of my favorite SolidWorks models from Baker Transmission. Out here, this drum, they called it a drum cam. And it's got these channels and grooves and passageways. And as that turns, it causes these pieces called selector forks to move axially and lock and unlock. These are the dogs that, that lock in and, and in that way lock and unlock the different gear ratios. So I like that. I kind of took that on board. How can I use that idea? There's a big problem still. And it's that bikes aren't motorbikes. 
They don't have a clutch. You can't have a neutral gear. So you can't have no gears engaged at any time because you always have to be able to pedal. You can't have two gears engaged simultaneously because then it would jam or break or something. And you can't change instantly from one gear to the next. So how are we going to get from one gear to the next? So my next big concept, my next big idea was this two-stage gear selection mechanism. And the first stage, so as, as you execute a ship, the first thing that will happen mechanically is that it will engage the next gear, the gear you want to be in. And then it will disengage the previous gear. And in, and in that manner, sort of safely transfer torque from one gear to the next. Um, and this will be done via one-way clutches. And that way only the higher gear will ever drive, and the lower gear will just overrun its clutch. So it's a safe transmission, like a handshake from one gear to the next. And I looked at how bikes, how they use these, these different mechanisms whoops, to transmit torque. Uh, this is a Paul and Ratchet system. That's what most mountain bikes use. Uh, but one company, DT Swiss, they have this, this face clutch called a star ratchet. And those move axially and, and lock and unlock and permit one-way clutching. So I, used, I like that idea, the star ratchet. Let's use that. This was an early concept they had. Uh, this is probably seven years ago. I modeled this up. Uh, and here, let's see it work. You can see up top, this, this is my drum cam. And it's got this pattern of, of bumps and peaks and valleys. And that's going to be rotated by the shifter. And that will affect these selector forks. They'll move side to side. They're actually acting as springs. Here you see it moves like that. And that's going to actuate these, these, these star ratchets or, or face clutches. Um, and I kind of ways down this, down this path, and then, and then I kind of took a step back, and I realized this is overly complicated. There's going to be too much friction. It's too big. It's not particularly elegant. Let's move away from it. So my next big concept was go back to planetary. Let's design a gearbox to use planetary gears. And instead of locking and unlocking the different sun gears, I want to have lockable rings. I want to lock and unlock the different ring gears. So I initially planned to design this with eight speeds. My initial calculations were for an eight-speed gearbox. But I talked to the owner of, of Zero and told him I was working on this, and he suggested that six would be plenty if it meant it could be a little bit lighter and simpler. So we went to six speeds, and given that we could achieve an appropriate gear range, so 250% gear range, the difference between high and low, and a nice even step, so 20% step between gears. This is much more consistent than you can get out of the derailleur system. And I looked at the different ways you can vary the ratio. So if I'm designing this with different tooth counts for the suns and planets, etc., the first concept is having a constant ring diameter. This is a cross-section through three different planetary sets. Constant ring, constant carrier, constant sun, and constant planet diameters. If I hold any one of those things constant, I can vary the ratios. And it turns out that I can get the biggest range of gears out of this first option. So that, that's what I proceeded with, constant ring diameters. And then I was faced with a number of extra constraints, these conditions that had to be met, that are, you know, in addition to what you have to do if you're designing simple parallel shaft spur gears. For a planetary system, the first condition states that the diameter of the suns and planets have to add up to the diameter of the ring here. That's fairly easy to, to imagine why that's true. Um, the next is that the planets, it has to do with the spacing of the planets, this angle. How Are they evenly spaced or are they unevenly spaced? You can imagine if you were going to have four planets, you would imagine they'd be 90 degrees apart. But it turns out that there's some cases where they won't assemble them. The teeth of the planets and the sun have to mesh. And if you get it wrong, they'll, they, they won't be able to assemble. So if I don't check this condition, I could easily have designed a gearbox that you couldn't put together. That would be a problem. And finally, this, this condition states that the teeth of the individual planets don't touch each other. So this diameter, DAB, this is the outside diameter of a planet. Technically, that's called the addendum of a gear. 
And, and so basically, this the addendum of this gear can't touch the addendum of that gear. Otherwise, they would jam, and the whole gearbox would lock up. So I had to meet all these conditions. So then I created this, this sort of vast Excel spreadsheet with the uh, the gear change rate, like the change between gears. These are my input fields with the, the number of the different tooth counts for the, the different parts. And, and across here, we've got all these checks uh, for the three different conditions, all the geometry. Uh, this extends about 100 columns wide. And you can see there's lots of different tabs. It, it's, a, it's, it's a vast uh, Excel spreadsheet. And then, and then I could start modeling. Um, so this was an early iteration. It was just a proof of concept that I could put this together. And, and literally, in SolidWorks, I could grab this point like it was a little handle and rotate it around, and I would see this little indicator turn and confirm that I was getting the ratio of out that I, I thought I should get. And, and it turned out that it, it did work. Um, but I still hadn't solved this problem of how to lock and unlock the different gears. And I wanted to use a pawl and ratchet system, but I had to control those pawls through a little spring, some sort of mechanism, toggles, levers, springs. I did a whole bunch of brainstorming and sketching, and I talked with other colleagues about this. And, and I was feeling kind of not great. I wasn't coming off with a good solution. Until I came up with magnets. And this was a little proof of concept that I 3D printed. Just make out, let's see, there. That's the pawl. And in here, and then I can change the state. And now it's a one-way ratchet. So I'm using magnets to control the behavior of the pawl. Sort of spring-loaded closed or spring-loaded open states. So that was a great use of 3D printing to sort of test that concept. That gave me some confidence to continue. This was iteration 15. You can see that this drum across the top is going to carry all the magnets. There's the pawls. It's got input and output on the right-hand side. Let's walk you through it. Power is going to come in from this rightmost sprocket, like this, down the center, gold colored sun shaft. And then out through one of two different gear sets by locking or unlocking these two different ring gears. And then back to a hollow sun shaft component here by locking one of the second three sets. So by this manner, I'm getting two times three gives me six different speed ratios out. And finally, return to this second sprocket and then it changed the rear wheel. So, uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I had the pleasure of working with these four students. They were capstone students last year. They worked uh, in parallel with me on this project. I proposed the idea. They developed their own gearbox separately from mine. But one thing they did was they made a discovery. I was focused on the gear ratios and the overall packaging. They looked at the forces, and they found that it was going to break. The forces were four times too high, and the teeth would have just sheared off. It was a catastrophic discovery, and I had to take a huge step back, back to the drawing board. Uh, now, the reason I have this slide here is to just stress to the students in the room the importance of doing this kind of paper-based sketching before you go to CAD. Even though I had the numbers from my Excel spreadsheet, just taking the time to do a simple drawing like this will ensure that your design is going to be such that it can be manufactured and assembled, and you've got to reason this stuff out before you try modeling in a 3D CAD environment. And then here we are up to iteration 32, and I've had to go back to the drawing board. I've really taken it apart, and, and this was a huge task to kind of invert the whole insides, how it works now is totally different. I've gone to a two-piece planet carrier and a one-piece sun shaft. So now the input the power comes in on the left-hand side. And that was a sacrifice. That means I've got to now use a left-side drive crankset. But that's easy enough. So now the power comes in like this to this green planet carrier on the left. And then through one of two gear sets, it travels through the center sun shaft back out one of three different sets, and then out to the far right for an output sprocket. 
this was a fundamental change in the way it worked. So in this particular gear ratio, the first and third ring gears are locked, and you can see the other ring gears, they just free spin, and that the green and purple uh, uh, planet carriers are turning at different rates, and I could stare at it all day. <laughs> <laughs> A quick, quick walk through the insides. This is the centermost component, that's the sun shaft. And then these other parts, these, these make up the rest of this, this is the, the central assembly is sort of this common sun assembly with all the different sun gears mounted on it. We can add all the planets and their little shafts are floating around the suns. And we add the carriers, we have the input and output, green and purple. And then we'll add uh, some more bearings and all the ring gears and their bearings. And up top you can see the little pole. And above that, this carrier, uh, this is the magnet carrier with the little pockets for each north and south pole magnet. And then the left part of the housing, and the right part, and then the input and output sprockets. And one thing I've added now is these large bearings are actually designed for the main swing arm to rotate concentrically around the gearbox. Okay, then I had to fork the design again to create an as-built prototype that was actually how I was going to prototype it. And so this is now designed to be water jet cut or 3D printed, and it's, it's open so we can see what's inside. Speaking of which, so we can see what's Ta-da! <laughs> Everything that's red is 3D printed. There is, oh, if I go one more slide, you can see a bit closer up. The yellow and black dots are the north and south pole magnets. And just below that are all the poles that will lock against these different ring gears. There's the two input, there's the three output, together making six gears. And I can shift, there's fourth gear, there's fifth gear. I can shift while pedaling or not. Dump a bunch of gears, back to third, etc. Perfectly. And back pedaling has this nice, lots of points of engagement, so there's not a lot of dead uh, free play here. If you ratchet the pedals, it's a very small, like one degree rotation, so that's an advantage as well. Um, so this was built using the water jet cutter and the 3D printer. Future versions would have to be made to gears. Anything with a gear form would have to be made by traditional gear manufacturing techniques. From hardened and ground to a steel. And then the body of it would be CNC machined. Uh, so I need to build this next prototype. I gotta design a frame around it. Um, more than I need to actually test it, put real torque through it, and, and ensure that it performs the way I hope. And then the next step would be to expand the, the user base by going to a nine speed version, and then that would open the doors to broader applications into all mountain and enduro bike applications. There's just a, this is not very well defined, but there's sort of loosely speaking, that's sort of one possible implementation. And Merzat's already addressed this, but here's the School of Energy uh, uh, website. If anyone else in the audience cares to try to, um, like to pursue a, a similar seed fund uh, initiative, then uh, I encourage that, it's been a great experience for me. Very much like to thank you know, the School of Energy in general, uh, all of my colleagues who've been wonderful resources. We're happy to talk with all the time uh, about this. Uh, lots of students have also expressed an interest, and it's been a joy to talk to them about it. Uh, family and friends, several family and friends are, are in the audience, and um, uh, my, my wife is, is sick to death of hearing about the classes. So we're just in the nick of time. What I propose is that I take a couple of questions now, but then if you'd like to see this up close, and maybe we can answer some questions in person, what I'd like to do is, is in, in a few minutes, move this show out to the lobby, just outside the front doors, and then I only really got plenty of time to set up a station there, and then we can talk one on one and I can answer any more questions that you might have. And you can have a, a closer look at this or, or any of the bikes. So um, before we finish, we'd like to I appreciate your effort and really interesting design that you have here. I think it's something. Is that a key? I know, I cannot.
<laughs> Thank you very, very much. Do you notice a, a speed of shifting difference between this and the derailleur system? It's oh, it would, it would be much faster. It, it would be much as, yeah. as, soon, as soon as you can do the shift, it's done. done. Right, so you don't have any of that having the pedal, pedal stroke and chug a chug it and jockey through. Pocket. That's good for the new.